So welcome back. We're again here with Friends of Flow, and my name is Tess Judge Ellis. And this is Andy Witters here. And and Tess, we have an awesome guest. I'm we really do, Andrew. Yes, we do. And so uh, we have Dr. K. Ball with us today, uh, one of the, the national leaders in, in, in smoke mitigation. Uh, and, and so, Tess, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Dr. K. Ball. Welcome, K. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you. Thank you so much for having this interview and including me. This has been a passion of my life, surgical smoke, for years. I'm uh, a past president of the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses and um, past president of their foundation, too. Um, I'm also a, a professor of nursing in Otterbein University in Westerville, Ohio. I've been a perioperative nurse since 1975. Wow. And that was my calling to go right into the OR. And I've been very involved with laser technology. I've written four editions of Lasers, the Perioperative Challenge. The last edition just came out in uh, February of 2018, just this year. And so when I got involved with lasers in, oh gosh, 1985, I became very aware of surgical smoke. And it's, I've had this passion since 1985. I started noticing it more and more and more when I got involved with laser surgery. That's when it was kind of brought to um, the forefront that we need to evacuate surgical smoke. And we do a good job with evacuation of laser smoke because we taught people you bring in a laser, you bring in a smoke evacuator. Sure, sure. So, but it's so electrosurgery that's the, that seems to be the plume that we just breathe in all the time today because we use electrosurgery a lot more than we use lasers. The main hazards of surgical smoke are the odor. That's an awful offensive odor. We can talk more about that too. And the size of the particles. They're ultra fine particles, very fine particles. Number three is the potential for viability of what is being transmitted within that plume. So Kay, you talked about the research that you did uh, in your dissertation. Can you talk specifically about the research methods that you used? Well, I, I had a survey that I put together and I validated the survey and it used Rogers Diffusion of Innovation. So I looked at ah, the yes. nurse, characteristics of the nurse. I looked at his or her perceptions of how difficult is it to evacuate surgical smoke? Do the smoke evacuators actually work? Is that their experience? And then I looked at the organization they worked in. Was it a multidisciplinary? Was it one type of surgery? Uh, and then I used all that information and I asked questions like, do you use a smoke evacuator uh, always, often, sometimes, never for a mastectomy? Do you use an inline filter always, often, sometimes, never for a hemorrhoidectomy? Do you use it for tonsillectomy? So I had a vast amount of, of procedures and when they use smoke evacuators, complying with what guidelines say you need to do. And then I took all that information and through statistical analysis, I was able to pull out those very general uh, results, like if they had um, knowledge about the hazards of surgical smoke, they were more apt to comply. If you know they worked in a large multidiscipline type of environment, more apt to comply. Good, strong leadership support, more apt to comply. Um, if they had smoke evacuators available, they were more apt to comply. Okay. So that's how my research was done. How many and surveys did you send out and get back? I, I got 777 back. I sent wow. about 2,000 surveys out. And these were sent to OR nurses, OR leaders? These were sent to AORN members okay. who were um, working in surgery and uh, working with devices that um, produce plume. And it was, it sounds like it was a, um, uh, not qualitative, but quanti, quanti well, I can't go. Yeah, it was quantitative and there was some qualitative. Excellent, it sounds like it was broad based and you had. Right, um, right. And so it, it was done in 2009. So I would love to see this and, and there have been people request my survey so they could replicate that in Ireland. I don't know the results of that yet, but uh, I would love to see some of this replicated so we'd know where we are today, 10 years later. Uh -huh. Well, that, that's a great feather in your cap too with your, with your research, right? Absolutely. I mean, I mean if, if, uh, if there are other places that are wanting to, to replicate um, your study, I mean, that, that, that shows that your study has 
has weight and has meaning, especially to the to the practice of uh, of these nurses. Well, and even more specifically, the tool. It sounds right. like you yeah, created absolutely. your own survey tool as a part of your dissertation too. Right. Okay. Right. And in, in using Roger's Diffusion of Innovations model, how accepting yeah. are we of making changes in our practice right. Right. was significant, too. Well, that's spoken like a true nurse, right? I mean, that n- n- right. nurses are known to just get the job done and, and adapt to whatever is on their, their plate. We're, right. we're just good at that. So, so you, yeah. you've and, been you've been how doing... how do we deal with complacency? And there was some that nurses were yeah. complacent, saying, I don't want to be bothered. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, um, which which can be a barrier in in, in instituting change. Absolutely, uh, at, at I times. identified four barriers in my study, but every every um, OR environment has their own little barriers because they have their own culture. But my right. barriers were the nurses said they weren't evacuating Plume because they didn't have the equipment available. Mm-hmm. Right. Or the second one was the surgeon said we don't have to do this, and the third one was the equipment's too noisy. Industry is making them less noisy and less noisy. Now smoke evacuators can automatically turn it on and off when plume is created. And the fourth barrier was staff complacency. Yeah. And so we found out that you just have to educate right. them. Right. If they rationally know why it's so important to evacuate plume, then they become proponents and they, they like that clean air smell now. Excellent. Um, I, I'd like to talk about um, what is in surgical smoke. What what makes it such a, a hazard? You mentioned uh, in the '80s, you noticed that it had a foul-smelling odor. Well, c- can you can you tell us a little bit what the research uh, uh, says is in smoke? Well, the research, you know, we can talk about the toxic gases in in surgical smoke. Um, there have been identified over. Uh, 150 toxic gases. That's what forms the odor. And some of those gases are carcinogenic, like formaldehyde, benzene, acrolein. Benzene has been shown to be the trigger for leukemia. Formaldehyde is what we set specimens with, and now we don't breathe in directly uh, formaldehyde when we put formaldehyde on our specimens. So these toxic gases are one of the major problems with surgical smoke. That gives it the odor. And then the other problem is the ultra-fine particles that are in the air. Dr. Mahashi, in his research years ago, showed that 77% of what's in the plume is 1.1 microns in size and smaller. Now, regular surgical mass filters 5 micron in size particles unless it's a high filtration mass that will filter down to 0.1 micron in size. So those toxic gases are going through the mass, the particles are sometimes going through the mass and going right down into the nurses or the techs or the surgeons alveoli of their own lungs because that's the size that they are. They're very, very small. Electrosurgery particles are the smallest And then the next largest is ultrasonic particles, and then laser particles are larger. But where do they go? They can go right into the alveoli of our own lungs, or we're sucking them right into the wall suction and starting to occlude the wall suction. So the suction doesn't work as well in surgery. Sometimes it's even shut off in the middle of a case because of all this occlusion of sucking in particles from surgical smoke for so many years. I have two Um, questions, Kay. One is, uh, what happens to the smoke once it's evacuated? Does it go through a filter system or? Yes. Smoke evacuation is a two-step process. You have to collect the plume, and that has to be a really good suction pull. The wall suction only gives you plus or minus um, five cubic feet a minute pull but a smoke evacuator can get up to 50 cubic feet a minute pull. So the velocity of the tip of that collection device is extremely important with a smoke evacuator. So the smoke evacuator has to be strong enough to evacuate that plume. So you collect the plume, and then you're gonna filter the plume. It's a three-step process. Uh, There's usually a little collection device that will collect any moisture and large particles, but then your ALPA filter, your ultra-low penetration air filter, will filter down to 0.1 microns in size at almost 100% efficiency. Much, much better than a HEPA filter. 
So smoke evacuators need to have all the filtration. And then to get rid of the odor, we have charcoal filters. Coconut-based charcoal is most absorptive, but charcoal filters will absorb those odors and get rid of the odor, all those toxic gases. So then so where we do we have to collect it and then filter it? So where does all that go then? Does it get trans? Is it like a hazard material, like a hazmat pickup? Is it a so once it's done, it you know what I'm asking? When the filter is all contaminated and the machine says you got to change the filter because usually they have lights that will come on saying they need uh -huh. to change the filter, um, you can put that in a red bag and then that can be put into the landfill. So there has never away. been any reports of a contaminated smoke evacuation filter transmitting disease in a landfill. But aesthetically, we think of a contaminated filter, we want to put it in a red bag, so we have to make it unrecognizable and disinfect it before we put it into a landfill. Okay, yeah, that's, I think that's a whole issue in and of itself is what goes into landfills. Well, so I, smoke evacuations do the job. We just have to use them. We have to get them in every right, single surgical right. room and we have to use them appropriately. Well, I, I like what you mentioned about uh, using uh, a yank hour suction, just a regular suction that's meant to, to pick up fluid, you know, and, and some of the research out there has suggested that that uh, quote unquote regular suction will actually uh, assist in spreading that smoke plume throughout throughout the room um, because if it's just going through depending on how the suction container well, there's is no set filter up, there's no charcoal it, yeah, thing or exactly. whatever so right? if there's no filters it just it's just being spread throughout throughout a room so that so that that's another sort of just well, I mean it's a, you think you're doing a good job when really you're not right. doing the good job right yeah so exactly. all the more reason to use the right tools like you described right. Kay, and exactly and the right material that's already out there Right. We have one other problem in surgery suites. A surgery suite is required <laughs> yeah. to have about 20 room changeovers an hour. So we have little currents of air going on right. inside our ORs. That makes it an OR. We don't want debris settling down into an incision. So we have these room changeovers going on. So if you don't have a smoke evacuator, you're just allowing the plume to go everywhere. Right. These little ultrafine particles are getting caught up on those air currents and being distributed nicely throughout the whole yeah. operating room. Right. So I could right. be circulating a case away from the table and be breathing in as many particles as the person who scrubbed at the table. Right. But the problem is research has shown that it takes about 20 minutes for these air particles to actually land on a horizontal surface. Mm -hmm. So we're hurrying at the end of a case, we're still using electrosurgery, we're making this smoke and it's not being evacuated. and we get the, the incision sewn up and, and put a um, dressing on it, take that patient immediately out, clean up the room very quickly, and bring in the next patient. Well, if it's within 20 minutes, some of those particles are still settling yeah. now down on the next patient. That's right. That's it's right. an infection control issue. We need to evacuate plume where it happens, when it happens, and then we wouldn't have any of these problems to deal with. You know, one more thing, you, you, you go into a hospital or a healthcare facility, you see on the front door a sign that says this is a smoke-free facility. And right. many nurses want to go down there with their magic marker and put except in the OR. Uh -huh. and, and it's so true that if we are a truly a smoke-free facility, we need to be smoke-free everywhere within the walls of that facility. And that includes taking care of the smoke and getting rid of the smoke in surgery. Because we have the technology, we just have to use it. We right. have to understand why it's so important that we have to use that. And for me, it sounds like it's just there, there's there are ethics behind it, work, workplace safety, patient safety. It just it, it, it again, this seems like it's just the right thing to do. Of course, yeah. So, Kay, you um, uh, can you talk a little bit about about Ethicon and how they've moved forward with this and and um, educational opportunities and such? Well, Ethicon's been a huge supporter of perioperative nursing. When I was president of AORN, they were always there understanding what nurses need to help their patients. But right now, Ethicon, and along with the, their newly acquired company, Megadyne, are very involved with surgical smoke education and making products to be successful and effective in evacuation of surgical smoke, making us a, a safe, smoke-free environment for us. I, in fact, I'm a paid consultant 
with Ethicon and I do lectures, generic lectures on the hazards of surgical smoke and how easy it is to get rid of smoke in surgical environments. And so Ethicon has promoted education throughout the United States on understanding the hazards of surgical smoke and, and how easily it is when they show their products on surgical smoke evacuation, uh, they're very effective. But I have to commend Ethicon as part of J&J &J, to always be interested in workplace safety issues and giving us products that will make our life as perioperative nurses a lot better that we can give the best care to our patients. So Johnson & Johnson's always been one of the world-class leaders It sounds in as education. though they listened to nursing and they did listen and they saw the problem and they moved forward trying to come up with creative solutions and they keep modifying those, it sounds like, too. Uh, at what point, or, or have you seen, in your opinion, uh, a turning point uh, with, with, with smoke evacuation? And, and can, can you speak to that just uh, a little bit? I think over the last couple years, I've seen a huge interest in surgical smoke evacuation. More and more, I go every year to our AORN Expo, and this year, you know, we have lots of different smoke evacuation companies on the floor. We had a couple companies um, speaking at their booth on surgical smoke for CE. Uh, and, and so I think over the last couple years, I've really seen a huge interest in this because AORN has the Go Clear Award now, and it's making it easy for members and other people to have a smoke-free environment. And with an organization as highly reputable as AORN and as trustworthy as AORN, for them to really, really push this, even though they've been pushing it for many years, uh, I, I think that's very important. So it's like, Kay, you can stretch out and go, hey, my work now is done. You guys yeah. take Not it yet. over. <laughs> Not yet? Okay. Not yet. We have to take over OB because yeah. OB, when they use electrosurgery, uh, produce plume and, and it's an awful offensive odor. We had a nurse, we had a patient who was going in for her first C-section, wrote a letter to the hospital president after the C-section saying, I thought this was going to be a, a pleasant experience, but your department stinks. She had no idea she was smelling her own plume that they were wow. creating oh, during wow. the C-section. Yeah. Yeah. The hospital president found out what the odor was from, and immediately they got smoke evacuators in the I OB department. Patients. For wherever plume is created, you have to have smoke evacuation. Whether it's in intensive care and you're doing something to debreed something at the patient's bedside, you need to have a smoke evacuator. Or in the ER, or doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. When they use hyphricators, you're producing plume in doctor's offices. That's where, when all that is smoke free. That's where I'll say my mission is done. There you go. Absolutely. Well, let's. Yeah, that's. I good. would toast to that. Let's, toast would, to no, change. Right. Yeah. Toast to change. Yeah. So let's take a nice deep cleansing breath of good <laughs> air, and like Kay, we asked you to think about something. If you were a new nurse or a younger nurse going in and wanting to be an advocate, even not necessarily with um, smoke evacuation, what would your words of wisdom be? My words of wisdom is if somebody has the passion and the excitement to work in surgery, then we have to provide clean air for them to promote this passion. So with new nurses coming in, I would say mandate that you're going to have a smoke-free environment because nurses want to work in clean air environments. Yes. Well, that's phenomenal. Thanks again, Kay, for joining us. Thank you very much, yeah. Kay. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for allowing me to share my passion. Absolutely. You know, hopefully it's contagious, and hopefully we'll get that message out that every OR needs to have smoke evacuation if surgical plume is created. Great. Thanks. This is um, Friends of Flow. I'm Tess Judge Ellis. And this is Andy Witters telling you to agitate, innovate, and educate. I say keep your eye on the patient. This podcast is sponsored by Ethicon US LLC. The information contained in this podcast and findings and conclusions expressed are those reached independently by the authors. Copyright 2018 Ethicon US LLC. All rights reserved.